We are in week two of a new series entitled Jesus Stories. And what we're doing is we're looking at the different miracles of Jesus throughout the Gospels. Now, there's roughly about 37 different miracles that we see throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and many of them occur more than, uh, in, in more than one of the Gospels. Some of them occur in every single one of the Gospels. Uh, some of them only occur in one of the Gospels. But um, there's roughly 37 different miracles that we're going to be taking a, a look at throughout this series. Now, this is incredible. At the very end of the Gospel of John, John writes and he says this. He says that if all the miracles were penned in Scripture, that all the books of the world could not contain them. If all the miracles of Jesus were written down in Scripture, that then all the books in the world could not contain them. Just think about the amount of miracles that Jesus actually did with that statement. You see, have you heard that phrase before, action speaks louder than words? Jesus' teachings were profound. But really, if it wasn't for him conquering death, hell, and the grave, if it wasn't for him doing what we read earlier in Isaiah 61, setting the captive free and bringing liberty and and healing the blind and salvation. If he didn't do all of those things, he didn't do any of these miracles, then his words would have just been great philosophy. But yet Jesus did all of these things. All of these things that we're covering in this series, he did, but he also did so much more than what we see. Like all, just get that for a moment. Just think about it. All the books in the world could not contain the amount of miracles that Jesus did. When I think about that, it just it, it blows my mind. But here's the thing about this statement is Jesus only did what his father asked him to do. He only did what his father asked him to do. And so if Jesus, the son of God, only did what the father asked him to do, how much more should we just seek after the Father and ask him, Lord, what are you asking me to do in my life? With every single step. You see, the mission of Jesus, which we read earlier in Isaiah 61, was a prophetic word that that's what he was going to come to do. And he stands up in a synagogue one day in a temple, and he begins to read Isaiah 61 as he opens the scroll And he says this, Jesus says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set a liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You see, this this is Jesus' start. This is Jesus' announcement that, hey, I'm here. I'm fulfilling Isaiah chapter 61. I've come here to set the captive free. I've come to bring liberty. I've come to save. I've come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And this is good news for not just his people, for everyone in the world. And so as we start this series, what you will find and what you will see is that everywhere Jesus went... It was led by the Spirit of God, and everywhere he went, there was miracles, there were signs, and there was wonders. He didn't just talk about it, but he walked it out with action. And so on his journey to walk out his, his mission, uh, our, our passage for today is in Luke chapter 19, it's the story of Zacchaeus, and he's on the road in Jericho, and we'll read this, Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. 
So he came down and at once, at once and was welcomed him gladly. Verse 7. All the people saw this and began to wonder. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house. This is the miracle we're talking about today, the greatest miracle of all, someone giving their life to Jesus. It says this, Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. The son of man came to seek and save the lost. I've entitled my message this morning this, Good news for the broken. Good news for the broken. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. That is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Lord, you coming is good news. It's good news for everyone, Jesus. Lord, your mission What you walked in, God, it blows us away. We are in awe of you, Father. Lord, you are a God who breaks chains. You are a God who sets the captive free. You are a God who brings salvation for those who are lost. And just as we sing about this morning, God, that it's not just for us, but it's for our children's children, God. Lord, we declare that in this house, God, this morning, that, Lord, this is not just for us, but it's for our children. We call every single child who is far from God to you this morning, Jesus. Lord, I pray that in this house this morning, God, that your spirit would just be released. Lord, you would, as we open your logos word, that, Lord God, you would breathe upon it, Lord. Lord, you have to breathe upon it because without it, Lord, my words are just so empty. So make your Logos word rhema to us. There's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Lord, I surrender to you this morning, Lord. We surrender to you this morning. Teach us. Teach us this morning, God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. I'm uh, almost uh, 40 now. (laughs) I'm turning 39 and... Two weeks or so. You know, and I, some of you in this room, you're like, okay, Adam, you're, you're not that old. And some of you in this room are like, Adam, you're, you're getting up there. You're, you're, you're pretty old. You know, there's things that I can't do now that I used to do when I was in my 20s. You know, when I go to play basketball, uh, I, lo- I loved playing basketball growing up. It was, it was my jam. It was like what I did every single afternoon after school. It was my passion as a teenager. And nowadays, when I pick up a basketball and I'm, maybe I'm playing with my son or someone else, and I go to hit someone with a killer crossover, you know, next thing I know is I feel like my, my knee's about to give out now. I, I do a little shake, and I'm like, oh, I'm about to fall over instead of cross them up. There are certain things that I, I can't do anymore. I mean, now, I used to, when I was in my 20s, I used to be able to stay up late. I'd stay up till midnight. I'd stay up to, to, to 1 o'clock. Nowadays, guys, honestly, any, any people who really, really know me, they know that, man, once 9 o'clock comes around, Adam's probably going to fall asleep here soon. It's just the way I am. Nowadays, I, I, I can't eat like I used to be able to eat. Uh, if I eat a load of, I love bread, I love pasta, like it's my favorite kind of food. Anybody else a foodie in here? Like, I love carbs, y'all. But if I eat carbs, man, I am so tired. I am just wiped out the rest of the day. And so I try to stay away from them the best I possibly can. I can't do things today that I once was able to do as a 20-year-old, as a teenager. I think about it even now. Like, I'm just such a particular person. Like, I want certain things in order. I find myself just getting really super, like, okay, I have to have uh, my bedside table this way and things laid out. And if something gets moved for my kids or someone else, I'm, I, get, I find myself getting a little frustrated inside when I shouldn't be getting frustrated inside. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm particular with how things are laid out and how things are, are operated within my house. And if someone comes in and I have plans to do something and they get interrupted, it almost kind of gives me a little bit of stress. Anybody else just feel that way? Like you were planning on doing something and now someone else is asking you to do this. And like, Laura will ask me to do something. I'm like, 
I immediately just feel this distress come over me because I'm thinking, so I, Lord, I don't know if I can do it because this, this is so much. Like, I'm such a particular person now. Nowadays, in, in, it, as, as I'm older, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I don't like crowds nearly as much. When I was in my 20s, man, I didn't mind crowds at all. Take me to the ball game. I don't care if I'm stuck in traffic after the game, right? Now, if I go to a ball game, like I'm leaving before the game's over so I can miss the traffic. I'm one of those people. I don't want to go to St. Augustine the, the week before Christmas because of all the crowds and all the people. Like, I'm just, now if there's a crowd here at church, I love it. Come on, if there's a crowd here at church, I love it. But anywhere else, anywhere else whatsoever, I do not like crowds. So as you're looking at this story with Jesus and Zacchaeus, you have to get this picture that there is a crowd following Jesus. And we see this throughout the Gospels. That's why I think that Jesus tried to get away so much because he was always surrounded by a crowd. And Jesus is walking away, walking along in Jericho, and he's gawking down the street, and there's crowds of people following him, and if, you have to get this picture shoulder to shoulder, and yet Jesus is going towards Zacchaeus. If I was Jesus, man, I'm backing away from the crowd. I'm sorry, Zacchaeus, I would meet with you, but it's too crowded. I'm sorry, I'm going the other direction. But Jesus doesn't care. What does he do? He goes towards Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, though, he's a tax collector. And you have to realize, he's hated by everyone. Nobody likes Zacchaeus. They view Zacchaeus like a dirtbag, like he's just not a good person, they think. He's not liked by society. Why? Because quarter after quarter after quarter, Zacchaeus shows up at the door to collect taxes. And they notice Zacchaeus that, okay, Zacchaeus' clothes are getting nicer and nicer. He's taking some of the money somehow. Uh, his, his house is getting bigger. Uh, everything that in his life is getting nicer. He's sending his kids to Alexandria for school. All these different things. He, spent, he has all this money. Zacchaeus does not lack financial means. And so the community is thinking, why is Jesus going to, towards Zacchaeus? But Zacchaeus, he had, makes this statement in verse 3. And he says, I have to see Jesus. I have to go. He wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to see who Jesus was. You see, he, Zacchaeus doesn't have any friends. He doesn't really have much going for him other than he has money. But he's lonely. But he has to see who Jesus was. So him being short, what does he do? He climbs up in a sycamore tree to see Jesus. Because he's so desperate to view Jesus. So I have to get in Zacchaeus' mind. Zacchaeus obviously has heard about Jesus. He's heard about how Jesus heals the sick. He's heard about how Jesus heals the blind. He's heard about all the miracles, signs, and wonders of Jesus, but he's also heard the teachings of Jesus that he'll bring liberty to those who are poor. How is Zacchaeus poor? He's not poor with material things, but he's poor in spirit. He doesn't have any type of relationship with God. He doesn't have any type of relationship with anyone whatsoever. He's living a very lonely life. So I want to give you three things this morning from this text. Here's number one this morning. Jesus is good news because he pursues you. Despite the crowds, despite the number of people in this world, he goes after the one. He goes after the one. Jesus is good news because he pursues you. And I love this encounter. I love this progression here. I love this pursuit. It says this in verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up. Say, looked up. Jesus looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I'm going to stay at your house today. So he came down at once, and he welcomed him gladly. I love here that Jesus, he looks up at Zacchaeus. He puts his gaze towards Zacchaeus. Despite who Zacchaeus was, he went and he searched Zacchaeus out. He looked up 
at Zacchaeus. You know, this is good news for us. This is good news for you. This is good news for me. That Jesus, he is looking your way. Understand that. Jesus is looking your way. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. It doesn't matter how you've messed up. It doesn't matter what your past looks like. Like Jesus, this is good news, y'all. Jesus is looking your way. And he says this. Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down. And I love this next part because he says, come down. He gives him immediate instruction. He doesn't correct him. He doesn't bring, bring the whip down. He doesn't, bring, uh, does, doesn't discipline him in that moment. He says, hey, Zacchaeus, come down with me. You see, it doesn't matter what Zacchaeus do, did. He just wants him to come to be with him. And this is also incredible because many scholars believe that this is the first time Zacchaeus heard his name since he was a kid. Because Zacchaeus' name means pure one. In society, then, wouldn't give him the honor. They wouldn't give him the time of day of calling him by his name because of what it meant. And so Zacchaeus, for the first time, in a very long time, hears his name. Zacchaeus, come now. This is good news for you and me. You see, Jesus, he calls you by name. He knows your destiny. He knows your purpose. Every single per person in this room has a destiny and has a purpose, and he's calling you by name. He's not calling you by something that someone else has said about you. He's not calling you by what you've put on yourself and saying, I'm a loser, I'm no good, I'm a nobody. No, Jesus says you are somebody, and I've got a destiny for you. I've got a purpose for your life, and he is calling you by name, and he is saying to you, calm down, come to me. Come to me, all you who are, who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. He is so desperate for you. He is in pursuit after you. This is good news. That Jesus, Jesus calls you by name, and he's saying to you, come with me. Come down. He calls you by name. This next part, he says, Jesus says, I must stay at your house today. He looks up. He says, Zacchaeus, come down. I must stay at your house today. You see, Zacchaeus, his house was a place of loneliness. His house was a place where he was all alone. His house was a place where he connived and he tried to Think of plans to, to get more money and to get more things from other people, but yet Jesus is saying, I want to come to your house today and I want to visit you. The place where Zacchaeus was the loneliest, the place where Zacchaeus was all alone and felt isolated. That's where Jesus wanted to go to. You see, Jesus met him right where he was at. This is good news for me and you because Jesus wants to come with you and have a relationship with you. In your loneliest place, in the place where you felt like, okay, I can't come to the Lord because I've messed up so much. You see, Jesus just wants to meet you where you were at. He wants to meet you right where you're at. In the places you feel the most isolated, the places that you feel most alone, this is good news because Jesus wants to meet with you. Number two this morning, the second thing, that I want to give you. First off, let me, let me ask you these questions before we go to number two. What puts you in the tree? What puts you in a tree? What keeps you running ahead at a distance? What things are you trying to accumulate that keep you at a distance from Jesus? What are the things that you have done that keep you distant from Jesus? You see, one of the lies of the enemy is that he will speak over us. He will try to say to us that Jesus is, God is a punisher. But God is not a punisher. He's a pursuer of you. He is not a punisher. You can come just as you are because he is pursuing you. So you don't have to choose distance. You don't have to keep running ahead. You are here for purpose. And it's a relationship with Almighty God. And this relationship gives you purpose. And that is good news. Jesus is good news because he pursues you. Number two now, Jesus is good news because he includes you. 
Jesus is good news because he includes you. You say that out loud, say, Jesus includes me. Really receive that. Jesus includes me. It's good news because he includes you. Verse 7, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he is gone to be the guest of a sinner. He is gone. Everybody else around him is saying, why is he going with that guy? He is gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, if you're a member in that community of that day, you are infuriated with Jesus in this moment. You were not happy with Jesus because he is going to go be with a sinner. He's going after him and not after everyone else who's trying to do the right thing. And it feels a little backwards to the community at that point. Because they're thinking to themselves, man, I've been paying my taxes. I've been giving. And yet, on top of that, I can barely provide for my family. I can barely put food on the table. I've been doing all of the right things. I've been trying to, to live for, you, for, for God. And I've been following the, the, the law and all these different things. And, he's, and, and they're realizing, they're frustrated, and they're infuriated that Jesus is going after this one person who's a sinner, who's far from him. Zacchaeus is the one doing this too, to that community. And yet Jesus says, I need to stay at your house, Zacchaeus. I need to have a relationship with you. And here's the miracle in verse 9. Here's the miracle. He says this about Zacchaeus. Today, salvation has come to this house. Today, salvation has come to this house. House. Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. You see, a moment of private surrender is used to end public suffering. Listen to that. A moment of private surrender is used to end public suffering. Zacchaeus says, I'm going to start living according to the Bible, according to the law. I want to do what's right. And because of this, because of Zacchaeus giving his life to Jesus and choosing to live for him, this one life surrendering to him, it changes an entire community, which leads me to point three this morning. Jesus is good news for the whole community. Verse eight, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back Four times the amount. Think about how big of a blessing that is to that community. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save that which was lost. If you start really thinking about this, Zacchaeus giving back four times the amount that he took from anyone. That's an incredible investment back in that day. It's almost as good as investing in Bitcoin when it first came out or Amazon when it first came out, y'all. Like that was a good investment for that time and for that season. Like you didn't get that type of return back in biblical days. But Zacchaeus is giving that type of return to those people. He's giving four times back, which then, what does that do? It frees them up to be able to live for the Lord and no longer be under Roman oppression. You see, it frees an entire community. One relationship, one crazy encounter Jesus has with this man Zacchaeus sets an entire community free. Think about that. When Jesus calls you to be Jesus to someone else in the grocery line, Think about the impact that that could possibly make for the kingdom of God. That one person could do so much good for the kingdom of God. Think about that one person that you've been ignoring, kind of scared to share the gospel with. Think about how they might make an incredible impact for the kingdom of God and change an entire community just like Zacchaeus did. You see, this is good news. This is good news that people are set free because the Spirit of God, you see, the, Spirit of, the, the Holy Spirit was upon Jesus, and Jesus was anointed to do all those things, and now he's left us with that same mission today. And the Spirit of God now, it rests on us. It rests on me. 
It rests on you. And that is good news. Look at verse 10 now. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And it wasn't just to get the lost into heaven. It's so much more than just being saved, y'all. It was to bring heaven to earth, to restore and to redeem our lost design, our lost relationship. Jesus took the Spirit of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon him, and he took it to the streets. Church, we must take Jesus to the streets and watch God chase and change our circumstances and our communities. Zacchaeus, though, Zacchaeus was so desperate for God. He had to see Jesus. You see, that's where it starts. That's where it begins. Just like I felt like the Lord spoke over us this morning, as we become desperate for the Lord, he's going to change the generations behind us, our children's children and their children's children. It's a promise of God. It's a blessing of the Lord. It's the blessing of his presence. It's not a blessing of monetary gain. It's a blessing of just having Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I want my children's children to have the blessing of his presence, that they would never know a day outside of the presence of God. They would never know a day separated from him, that the world, they're trying to go after them with everything else, and Disney is trying to take their minds away and take back what is good and it's a lie of the enemy but I'm here to tell you we're putting a line in the sand and we're saying no our desperation is after Jesus and Jesus alone and he is going to bring them to a place of salvation he's going to bring them to a place of knowing him are we truly desperate for Jesus because Zacchaeus he had to see Jesus he had to see Jesus Ben, would you join me? He had to see Jesus. My one pursuit and my one desire is for us to truly see Jesus. Some of you knew in this room, you've never had the opportunity to and really had that type of encounter where you've really experience the tangible presence of the Almighty God, where you've gone and you were desperate, where you, where you did anything you possibly could just to see Jesus. You see, Zacchaeus did whatever he could to see Jesus. He climbed up in a tree, but he was scared. He was alone, and he was, he was broken, and he was hurting, but he had to see Jesus. You listen, some of you in this room, you were hurting, and you were broken, and the only result, the only thing that's going to give you life is the desperation to see Jesus. Are we desperate to see Jesus? I have to see my Father. I have to see Jesus. Would you rise with me? I want to end with how we began. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And this is for us for today. Because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. You see, Jesus wants to set you free. He, everything, every lonely place in your heart, he wants to come in and he wants to, you to invite him into his house. He says, hey, I want to come meet with you. I want a relationship with you. I desire just to be with you. I desire only you if you would just be desperate for me. If you are desperate for the Lord, I want to invite you. Would you meet me down front right now? If you're truly desperate for the Lord, you see, it takes us sometimes. You see, Zacchaeus was bold enough to step out. Zacchaeus was bold enough just to say, I don't care about anything else. I'm going to climb up in the sycamore tree because I have to see Jesus. If you were desperate to see Jesus, maybe you want to give your life to Jesus. Maybe you want to surrender uh, your life to him for the, for the first time. Or maybe you want to rededicate your life. Maybe you're desperate because you need healing. Maybe you're desperate this morning because you felt like there's this anxiety and you're bound. Whatever it might 
might be. Maybe you're just desperate because like everyone in this room, like I, I don't know, like there should be all of us in this room just be desperate for, you, for Jesus. If you were truly desperate for Jesus, would you step out of your comfort zone right now and me be here at the front? And all in this moment, we're just saying, Lord, we're desperate for you. If we really want a move of God in our life, you see, revival starts with us personally. It starts with us personally. If we want that, it takes a desperate step out.